Hi, I'm David Dory. Um, I am a bachelor's student in uh, math and economics, uh, senior. Uh, this is a presentation on a paper by Bob Passadu and Jen Timis. Uh, they're, uh, they were working at Duke at the time that they wrote this paper. And the topic of the paper is modeling collaborations with persistent homology. So this is a diagram that I'm going to use to tie it all together at the end. But I wanted to show it at the beginning because it's, it's a really cool diagram. Um, OK, going to move over, over to the whiteboard. The problem um, that we've got in this paper is we'd like to have a s simple uh, yet predictive model of social networks. Um, in particular, social networks uh, built up on the collaborations among mathematicians. And we would like for this model to be able to answer a couple of questions um, that normally we'd need to assess qualitatively. Um, questions like, why might a social network fail? Because mathematicians are antisocial. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, although I, I suppose then I would be the counterexample. Um, and, and, and also, are the divisions that we have to make, um, uh, you know, if you have a big, big math department, oftentimes uh, you might have a, a math building with multiple floors. You divide up offices depending on who you think has similar research interests. Are the divisions that we make meaningful? Are these, are these good divisions? Um, and kind of a common sense way of modeling this type of thing is with an abstract simplicial complex. Um, the reason I say common sense is because there's this whole field of bibliometrics, bibliometrics, which is basically uh, built on the approach of take a bunch of vertices, each vertex is a mathematician, or for that matter, a, a scientist, a writer, any sort of thing, and then draw edges between them depending on, uh, depending on who's doing the model. It might be that an edge goes between them if they've cited one another, or if they've worked together, um, you know, uh, and any number of uh, things. Uh, or, you know, abstract simplicial complexes can have, uh, can have simplices, simplices of higher dimensions. You might say, well, if these three have worked together on a project, just go ahead and fill that triangle in, uh, add that into the simplex. Okay? So all of that has been considered uh, in this kind of bibliometrics literature. But this is not a bibliometrics paper. The idea in this paper um, is going to build though on uh, on this uh, there it is on this idea um, of the abstract simplicial complex as a tool. So I'm going to review um, properties of the abstract simpl simplicial complex. I hope you can see this. Um, if k is an abstract simplicial complex and sigma i is an i simplex, so dimension i, then we can take sums over such simplices. So say a is a sum over, uh, over i simplices uh, with coefficients living on a field uh, as, as we study. We call a an i chain. Then a is an i cy cycle if and only if its image in the boundary map is zero. So uh, that cycle would actually look like a cycle if you drew it up, uh, as I'll draw it in the board in a minute. Um, and it's a boundary if and only if there's something uh, to be the boundary of. So basically, if you're an I cycle, you're in the kernel. If you're an I boundary, you're in the image. And so, uh, taking the quotient of uh, cycles over boundaries is the same thing as uh, kernel over image is the same thing as the homology. Um, now, why am I rehashing all of this? Because when we talk about social networks, even when we do so informally, we are often talking about uh, circles of friends. Okay? So, Here's one instance of, uh, you know, you have three people, they are collaborating. If we just took these edges and oriented them in the proper way, then the image of that I chain would be zero, making it an I cycle. Uh, but it's only an I boundary if we also include this triangle in the middle. Okay. 
All of this, again, comes up in bibliometrics literature, but this is not a bibliometrics paper. The idea in this paper is to uh, generate some distance metric on mathematicians. It, it, it may be the case that mathematicians are antisocial, but you, you can bet that the mathematicians would find a way to measure how antisocial or social they are. <laughs> um, and, and, and in fact, they have done so in this paper. Uh, although one of them is an economist, so, so go figure that. Um, so to find some sort of metric on mathematicians, use that to compute a uh, via torus rips complex. Okay, covered everything? Yes, we can, we can move on. So the distance metric that they use in this paper, and this is uh, admittedly quite simple, um, is a uh, linear combination of five different metrics. Um, one metric is, do these individuals have work at the same institution? Another, do they have a shared subfield? Do they get their PhD from the same institution? Have they collaborated in the past? Again, we're trying to predict future collaborations, but that doesn't mean we can't make use of past collaborations. Um, and we also make use of past citations. Um, these are all defined in three space. Um, so it has to be zero if x and y are the same person, because that's uh, part of the definition of being a metric, is if x and y are the same thing, then the distance between them has to be zero. Um, it's one if the condition is satisfied, if they, uh, for instance, got their PhD from the same place, and it's two otherwise. Um, we sum these guys up in a way that, uh, so I, I didn't write this on the slide, but it's actually going to be weighted by some coefficients. Um, so I guess I should draw that. Um, I'll just draw D1, X and Y, plus ellipses, D5, X and Y. But in front of those, I'll mark this in red, we're going to put some coefficients. Alpha 1, alpha 2, 3, 4, and alpha 5. How do we know what those coefficients are? We don't. Um, but the way that we compute those is using backtracking and Bayesian analysis. So basically making use of those past collaborations not only as independent variables but as dependent variables and running a kind of uh, lagged dependent regression of sorts. Um, it is a linear regression. Uh, so it is. So it is. Um, now, once you have this distance metric, you can build a nice matrix, which tells us you know, how close, uh, how, how likely our mathematicians are to collaborate. I've been using five a lot lately, so I'll go A, B, C, D, E. Uh, so suppose I'm just considering five mathematicians. Of course, these uh, researchers are considering far more. But we have a matrix. The distance between any two identical mathematicians is going to be zero. So zero is on the diagonal. And then every other entry tells you something about the distance. You take those distances, and you can build up a viatoris rips complex. That is where we get this nice picture at the end. Okay? So um, if your radius of your, of your viatoris rips complex were zero, then you have all these points uh, with no edges in between them. You, you amp it up a little bit, you get more edges, you amp it up more, and you start to actually get faces in it. Um, now, again, I'm rehashing a bit. Um, and there's a reason why I'm doing that. Because there's a particular interpretation um, when, you, uh, when you look at the, the space of mathematicians uh, through the lens of this persistent homology. So suppose I have five mathematicians, uh, via torus rips complex is a filtration. So I have K1, it's my uh, abstract simplicial complex with no edges. It is definitely a subset of K2, which is going to have maybe one more edge. 
um, all the way up to kk, which has all the edges. Radius of infinity, or some such thing. It's a very, very large radius. Um, so if I'm in k1, well, every point is in the kernel, because the boundary of a point is, is always zero. Um, but no points are in the image, because, well, you can't be the boundary of an edge that doesn't exist, and there are no edges. So every single one of these is in homology. The homology has dimension 5. We have five connected components. In other words, none of these mathematicians talk to each other under uh, this model. And that's probably not a good model. You're, good, you're, going to, uh, you're going to move your radius up a little bit. Um, and I think they found that 60% was, uh, was about the... Uh, yeah, if they, if they, I think they, they, moved, um, they moved to about 60% of the maximum distance. Five minutes? Okay, thanks. Um, that, was a, uh, that was a pretty good measure. So we have these connected components. As we amp the radius up, though, uh, the dimension of the, uh, of the zeroth homology space shrinks. So the zeroth homology space equals just the set of connected components. Now going back to the example where uh, you have a big math apartment, different floors, perhaps those connected components, uh, you want to correspond to those floors because you'd like the divisions that you make in your department to have some sort of meaning. Um, or perhaps you, uh, perhaps you do the opposite, because you want to foster collaboration between these two connected components. Now, under what circumstances might that be useful? That's what H1 and H2 are going to tell you. Why? Well, H1, and this is why I did all the rehashing in the beginning, H1 is the set of one cycles quotient the set of one boundaries. So consider a one cycle like this pentagon right here, okay? This is a social circle, as we might call it kind of informally, but it's not a very well connected one because yes, everybody in the circle is talking to somebody else in the circle, and you know, if I wanted to get a message from here to here, I could definitely get there. It would, it, it would just go through some intermediaries. But if I started to throw edges in here, that would make it slightly, uh, slightly more connected social circle. The claim in this paper um, that I found most interesting was that the barcodes in H1 and H2 correspond to impediments to collaboration. In other words, this sort of thing happening where you have a disconnected social circle. You have a social circle which has not been triangulated. Now, if I moved this guy, if I moved this point just a little bit inward so that it now falls within the radius of these two mathematicians, now the whole thing triangulates. We start getting two phases in here. And, and the reason that this cycle was in H1 was because it was a cycle, but not a boundary. But now it is a boundary. Because if you, if you take, um, I, I, uh, I might mess up the orientation here, but if you took these three faces and got the orientation somehow correct, um, don't quote me on the orientation, but if you, if you sum these faces up with a correct orientation uh, and then took the boundary, you would actually get the outline of this thing. You would get these, uh, the one cycle. Okay? And a similar kind of thing happens on H2, and actually H3, H4, and so forth, um, which I'll draw as best I can. The reason I picked five to be the number that I number of mathematicians I use is because it's the minimum amount that you need to draw a trapezoid that is non-triangular. So in other words, it's, uh, it's two triangular trapezoids glued together. Um, and suppose that I include, uh, well, it's a viatoris ribs complex, so I'm including all these edges, one, two, three, four, because I include all the edges of a, uh, of a um, 
of a triangular pyramid. I also include the pyramid itself and all its faces, and same thing here. But this mathematician and this mathematician aren't speaking to each other. Um, so uh, if you end up in H2, that's because you have a two cycle. So all these faces that form the uh, that form this kind of bubble, but you do not have that as a boundary. There, uh, the space inside that is not filled in. So tying everything together over here, if we chart the barcode diagrams as the radius increases on H0, that tells us something about the connected components. Uh, these four biggest connected components, actually, or rather the three biggest connected components, turn out to be analysis, um, analysis, combinatorics and logic, and applied mathematics. Kind of three <laughs> categories, if, if you will, in, uh, in mathematics. Um, these H1s uh, tell us something about uh, base, uh, cycles forming, uh, one cycle's forming before they kind of coalesce into these uh, triangulated things, and a similar thing with H2. And then a cool property with this persistent topology is that we can actually track how much you need to increase the radius in order to tri triangulate the structure, make the, uh, make the network uh, more connected. Um, and the amount that you need to increase that radius corresponds to the length of the bar. Um, so, I, I think that's a good place to stop. Questions? They're estimated using Bayesian analysis and backtracking, um, which they actually don't explain in detail in the paper, but my best understanding of it is that they're, they're using uh, existing data on, uh, so basically they have access to these, the data on whether, um, on whether mathematicians collaborated and in particular what year they collaborated, and then they're just uh, using, uh, using those variables to predict their right. future variables. Future values. So, uh, my question is what's the benefit of viewing these things as via Torps Rips comp complexes rather than using um, just generic network theory? Like, uh, do, 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 does it make computation time just like have it or make it just a lot quicker mm. in terms of actually mm -hmm. analyzing it, or does this make a lot more sense for certain data sizes? So by uh, by generic network theory, you're referring to bibliometrics as yeah. yeah. So the difference is actually the paradigm. Um, so this idea, which is to generate some distance metrics on mathematicians, that's a very different idea uh, from just taking the existing collaborations or and citations that exist in the data. This idea is saying let's try to predict future uh, collaborations. And that's important, well, in my view, that's important because um, a lot of the decisions that we make in academia, or could be in industry, uh, you know, you, you could be applying this uh, in management of an industry, um, a lot of the decisions that we make are trying to foster <coughs> collaborations, collaborations that are in the future, not the past. Um, but I mean, can that not be done with bibliometrics at all? Or is, or is uh, it can be done, but more qualitatively is my understanding. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, this has implications for hiring. For hiring? Because essentially oh, sure, you're sure. trying to foster right. collaboration. So who right. should you hire? You want to hire someone that's going to, in fact, cause a change in the homology. Right. right. So if I, if I uh, a new hire should be green, obviously. Um, but yeah, so, so if, I, if, I put, if I drop this person into the middle, then maybe this person can collaborate with this person, and so forth. And, uh, well, yeah, if the radius is equal, yeah. then yeah. it actually yeah. collaborate with everything, yeah. everybody, uh, and then the whole thing you're trying to do. Great, great. Right. Other questions? Great.